Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, it falls to me to say a few words about the economic outlook. Um, and I've been struck over the last few days um, by some surveys which show that more than nine in 10 adults in the country now report firsthand experiencing uh, the cost of living squeeze that's ongoing. And this is gonna be a theme of my talk today because I think 2022 is really shaping up to be the year of the cost of living squeeze actually. Um, even at a time where uh, firms tell us that they're continuing to put up prices uh, at the fastest on record. Um, so what I'm gonna try and do today is just to give a little bit of a better understanding about how those cost of living, living pressures that people are coming under are likely to affect the economy going forward, specifically the visitor economy. Um, my talk's kind of in two halves. Um, I wanted to talk about how high and rising inflation is likely to affect the outlook. Um, it's not good. Um, secondly, I wanted to focus on the reasons I think we do have for being a bit more confident and dare I say optimistic about the outlook um, for the next year or two. So let me just kick off by um, focusing on how that high and rising inflation is affecting the outlook. Um, so the first thing to say, as you can hopefully see, is that consumer prices are now rising very, very rapidly, certainly at the fastest pace uh, in my working lifetime. Um, the rate of consumer price inflation has hit a 30-year high, 6.2% in the year to February. That's three times the Bank of England's official target. Um, and it's really been driven by household energy bills uh, in large part. Those are going up very significantly. I mean, wholesale gas prices are currently at around about three times the level they were at uh, six months ago. We've also seen big rises in fuel costs. It will not have escaped you if you filled your car up recently. Uh, average cost of unleaded petrol currently at uh, £1.64 a litre. So that's up 40% in a year. Um, but it's not confined to energy and fuel. We've seen pretty broad-based price pressures, including rising prices of goods, uh, as, as people have wanted to buy a lot. Um, just in February, we saw clothing prices go up quite a lot, furniture prices. This is increasingly broad-based. Broad Even uh, food is rising, um, and this is really putting a strain on the budgets of some lower-income households especially. Um, food price inflation running at a, a decade high, 5.1%. So we're not alone in facing this here in Scotland. Um, this is uh, a problem right around the developed world, actually, um, right across markets, which I know are important sources of international visitors here in Edinburgh. Um, in Canada, uh, inflation is currently running at 5.7%. In the Euro zone, uh, it's currently 5.9%. And the US, which does like to lead the way, <laughs> currently experiencing uh, almost 8% inflation. So what I would say is this inflationary squeeze that we're currently under really is a common problem among what I think is you know, a large part of the clientele right now. I'm supposed to talk about the outlook, so what next? Well, I think expect the rate of inflation to keep climbing over the, the next few months, certainly probably much of the next year, and to remain very high over that time as well. Um, the Bank of England in their latest set of projections issued about seven weeks ago, uh, expected inflation to peak at just over 7% next month uh, when uh, the gas and electricity regulator lifts the energy price cap further. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, though, uh, has put even further pressure, upward pressure, uh, on those price rises. We've seen oil prices spike to their uh, highest level in a decade, uh, up 50% compared to January levels. Um, if gas prices are sustained in the way that markets are currently sort of pricing, that points towards uh, the, uh, the energy price cap going up again come October, uh, possibly by as much as 40%. Um, and that's on top of the 54% rise coming next week. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, and at the same time, um, Ukraine and Russia are both important producers of foodstuffs. Uh, they account for around 12% of all the calories that are currently traded around the world. And Russia is a pretty important producer of potash. Uh, it's an ingredient in fertilizer production. So the price of that's gone up. Its use is going to go down. 
yields are going to go down right around the world. It's going to have some pretty profound impacts on, on prices of uh, a wide range of goods and services. All in all, this probably means that uh, the R Russia's war is going to add between one and two percentage points to the rate of inflation. That's probably the main way it's going to impact on the UK's economy overall, um, uh, separately from the kind of trade effects and uh, the impact on visitors directly. Um, which means we're now looking, and I'm showing here the kind of forecasts from the Office of Budget Responsibility, the government's official forecaster published last week. It's now looking like inflation's going to hit around 8% this spring and probably around 9% in the autumn of this year. So it'll be high for even longer than we previously thought. I realize I'm sounding a bit pessimistic here, but <laughs> I don't want to hold back. I mean, a key consequence of this, unfortunately, is it's really going to drag on the economic recovery as we move uh, further into the year. Um, the UK is a net importer of energy. Uh, we're a net importer of goods, too. So as we pay more for these things, there's just less money to spend on domestic uh, activities, domestically produced services, uh, the sort that you do so well. What we saw last week, um, and this is in common with many other forecasters, was the OBR has slashed its forecast for economic growth over the course of this year um, from 6% to 3.8%. Um, now, 3.8% growth still sounds pretty good, right? That's, that's much better than a normal year's worth of growth. Um, the sad truth is that because the economy has been recovering so well from COVID, even if we didn't have any more economic growth following January, the economy would still be 3% bigger this year than last year. So I guess that's a good thing. But what we're really looking at and what I've shown here is that the quarterly pace of growth is really going to uh, really going to slow down quite uh, quite significantly from a, a rate of around one percent a quarter, which we've had recently to just 0.2 percent by the end of the year. So it's essentially the recovery kind of temporarily grinding to a halt. Um, there is some good news here. As I say, the economy is bigger than last year. Um, and there's also likely to be a degree of catch up growth as we move into 2023 and 2024. But this is not the 2022 that we were hoping for. And a key consequence for households is that living standards are likely to fall as um, inflation outstrips wage growth over the course of this year. And we are looking, I think, at um, some pretty healthy nominal wage growth this year. So people are likely to see their wages go up at a, a, at a, a healthy clip. But the fact that inflation is sky high means that in real terms, households' disposable incomes are likely to fall by over 2% this year. Uh, two, that doesn't sound maybe too much to you, a 2% dip, but it would be the worst uh, ever recorded by the Office for National Statistics in data that goes back uh, more than 65 years. So it really is quite a bleak picture. Um, it's equivalent to the, the typical working household losing around about £1,000 a year in their purchasing power. Um, and it could take two years for those real incomes to recover to their pre-pandemic levels. So I think this is going to be, and the reason for that sort of macroeconomic slowdown is that this is going to weigh on consumption spending. I mean, people are going to have less in their pockets to spend. And this is true both here in Scotland, but also right across the developed world. So I'm afraid I think a period of belt tightening is probably inevitable. Um, I think people are really going to be focusing on what's most important to them. They might be persuaded to spend out, but to, to splash out and to spend on things, but I think only where it, it really offers them value um, in, in this kind of context. When it comes to who's facing the pain, um, I think the answer is it's going to be shared really quite widely. Um, most households are going to experience some kind of squeeze over, over the next year. These kind of magnitude of shocks, that 2% drop in uh, household incomes, that's normally associated with a kind of recessionary period. Only in recessions, it's normally a, a small, unlucky few households that experienced very large drops in their incomes. And actually, we saw that in the early days of COVID. It was those who were out of work, those who were furloughed, who saw their incomes drop quite significantly. It's a bit different right now. Everyone is in for more of a modest squeeze um, over, over the course of the next year. Um, we did hear last week the Chancellor unveil uh, some tax cuts for people. Um, those will offset some of the pain, um, actually around a, about a third of the uh, fall in living standards that people would otherwise have faced this year. 
Um, and they are progressive. They're worth more to the poorest households than to the richest. Um, on average, the bottom half of the income distribution will about, be about 400 pounds a year better off because of uh, fiscal policy decisions next year. But even so, hopefully, you can see on this chart that when it comes to 2022-23, it's the, the red bars, the poorer households who are likely to experience the greater proportionate hit to their incomes. But richer households too, actually. And that, again, has something to do with fiscal policy. It's because of the new health and social care levy, which is being introduced and is going to push up national insurance contributions, uh, especially for the higher earners uh, in society. Um, all of this, I should caveat, assumes that there are no further uh, major giveaways by governments. It is quite possible that we could see some further measures to ease the pain uh, later in the year. Um, the Chancellor certainly retains some room for manoeuvre in that space. The government is comfortably on track to meet its fiscal targets. And there was a bit of a windfall from, for public finances as a result of the, uh, the higher inflation that brings in higher tax revenue. The Chancellor only spent around half of that windfall. So he's kept quite a lot in his back pocket. So I would not be surprised if we did see uh, the government respond uh, to, to this price pressure by, by coming forward with more reliefs later in the year. So that could make this picture slightly less bad. Final bit of uh, unwelcome news. I think inflation is forcing the Bank of England to raise interest rates at the moment, um, pushing up the cost of servicing debt for borrowers um, at clearly uh, an unwelcome time. Although when is a welcome time? We've seen already three back-to-back -back increases in uh, the official interest rates over the last few months, taking them to three quarters of 1%. That's the same level as they were at before COVID. Now, the official guidance from the, the Bank of England, from monetary policymakers, is that we're likely to see modest further rises in interest rates, um, and that those aren't guaranteed, but they're likely. Um, now, I, I share that view. I think that that probably is the case, and that we're likely to see uh, rates go up by perhaps half a percent more over, over coming months. But the collective wisdom of financial markets is still that we'll see much quicker and stronger pace uh, of interest rate rises uh, with monetary policy tightening quite significantly over the coming year uh, and official interest rates perhaps reaching 2% over that, that time. So that would add quite a lot uh, to, um, to, to debt servicing costs. I do think though that Bank of England are only likely to do that if they see risks crystallizing around inflation becoming entrenched in the economy. So if they see a lot of evidence of firms taking the opportunity to push up prices um, uh, uh, above inflationary rates, if they see uh, uh, pay bargaining, kind of uh, push up wage settlements, I think it's only then that really they would feel compelled to, to move to the extent that markets are pricing in. But all of this is um, going to add to the squeeze generally that's facing consumers at the moment um, out there. So what reasons are there to be more optimistic about the outlook? Well. Um, it is certainly the case that Scotland's economy started 2022 strongly, and it is in a much better place than it was in last year, um, as, as we heard uh, earlier on. So the past 12 months has seen a, a truly impressive recovery from what was the, the, the deepest recession um, uh, in, in anyone's lifetimes. Even in January, the Scottish economy grew by more than 1%. That's really significant for a single month. And it's remarkable given that even then, Omicron and COVID was, was so prevalent uh, uh, in the economy. Um, that really kind of bounced back uh, from the contraction that we saw at the end of last year. And the economy is now bigger than it was uh, before the pandemic struck. Um, just think back to uh, the start of last year, um, we were looking at a 10% smaller economy overall. We've now clawed that back um, overall. So there is a much sounder base going forwards, I think, for, for, for all of our activities. I only got a few caveats to make to this one, which is that when it comes to the size of the economy, we, we must bear in mind that the size of the state has increased over the last two years. So government's doing more. The implication is that the private sector is still doing less. And that is true overall. And in particular, consumer facing services activities, you know, hospitality, um, uh, food and drink, 
uh, retail activities are still performing uh, worse than the economy um, overall. So there is still uh, room for growth there. Um, and as has already been mentioned as well, we've also seen big shifts in where and how people are spending. So online spending uh, is sort of up by 50%, um, but people are still spending less in, in city centres. Um, and when it comes to that, we know that Edinburgh over the last couple of years has been particularly um, hard hit. Uh, the third worst hit out of any city in the UK, according to the Centre for Cities, um, with high street businesses kind of really suffering. So um, I know that for everyone, it will not feel like things are back to normal. But we have still had this really strong rebound. And that, again, is in common with what we've seen uh, around the world. So other advanced economies have bounced back just as strongly, uh, actually even better than the UK uh, overall. We're actually something of a laggard in this space, having uh, suffered worse than uh, some others. But you can see that uh, the EU economy is 1% larger than it was before COVID. And again, the US leading the way, they might have high inflation, but they're also uh, have grown their economy by, uh, by more than others. Um, so the same picture is basically true across many other markets, uh, most of the G7 overall. And what's more, like the, the recent strength that we've seen, the recent recovery has actually continued um, over uh, the first quarter. So February and March were, were both good months as well. Um, this is the Purchasing Managers Index uh, of Business Activity. And what we see there is kind of renew, renewed momentum. So businesses report activities expanding uh, uh, over the course of February and March at a pretty healthy clip. Um, overall, implying that we will see when the official stats get released, solid growth uh, in those months too. The same is true, this is a, a national, UK national composite figure. The same is true if we look at Scotland. Um, when it came to February, the, the PMI was at, uh, was at a recent high um, and it has been strongest in the services sector. So that's all really encouraging, I think. We also see it in other more timely data. If we look at where people are spending, where card spending is going, debit and credit card spending. If we look at social settings, um, then what we've seen over the last few months is a really strong recovery. Um, I know it was a terrible pre-Christmas trading period as Omicron struck, but things have bounced back really quickly. And that card, expending, card expenditure in social settings is now above uh, uh, pre-pandemic levels. So I'm really heartened by this. I think just again, we've seen the, the resilience and the adaptability of the economy uh, over the last few months demonstrated. And I think that's great considering, um, as was mentioned before, that perhaps we're not out of the woods when it comes to COVID yet. There may still be future waves uh, coming along. So it's good to know that we can kind of get through them uh, in a sort of quick, quick manner without too much disruption. Now I'm gonna put a positive spin on what was voted to be uh, one of the significant challenges facing business uh, this year um, by you all. I think the, just the widespread availability of jobs at the moment is likely to give people confidence over the coming year and more confidence than they would otherwise have given the squeeze on their, their incomes. Um, and probably, you know, that, that confidence to spend is another cause for optimism. Um, uh, when I uh, when, I, when I was speaking to people last autumn, I very much was in the camp that we were likely to see uh, a small rise in unemployment following the end of the furlough scheme. That did not come to pass. Uh, and we saw the Office, Office for Budget Responsibility cut its forecast for unemployment uh, similarly uh, recently. Um, instead, we've seen unemployment continue to come lower, hit just 3.8% uh, in the most recent period, which it's not only kind of back to the, the pre-pandemic low levels, but it, that is the lowest that we've basically seen since the mid 1970s. Um, essentially, everyone who wants work has work of some kind. Um, and more than that, we've seen unfilled vacancies continue to rise. I'm sure this won't be a surprise to, to some of you, but they've reached uh, record highs, uh, 1.3 million unfilled vacancies across the UK overall. Um, to put it in context, that's four unfilled vacancies for every 100 jobs that there are. Um, or put another way still, it's enough to give every person who's unemployed uh, a job overall, which is what this chart tries to show. We've, we've not been in many situations like this. Um, and hiring activity still continues uh, to, be, uh, to be strong. 
So clearly this is a bit of a double-edged sword. I think it is good from a household's perspective and that's welcome at these times. But it, it clearly also makes recruitment very, very challenging. It clearly also makes retaining people very challenging. And what we've seen is that uh, the degree of churn in the labour market has really picked up as well. Record numbers of people chose to leave their jobs uh, in the second half of last year. Um, in the fourth quarter alone, there were more than 1.1 million people changing roles. And, and it's, this is not an involuntary thing. People are not being forced out. This is predominantly being driven by people resigning and, and, and moving jobs because they found something they want to do better. So this is a hard time to hold on to people. Um, and we, we do hear uh, frequently uh, a, a, lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of concerns uh, around this. But... The fact that people have got those opportunities to increase their pay, to increase their hours uh, in response to the cost of living squeeze, should they want to, um, I think really could uh, underpin uh, some resilient demand uh, through this year and kind of make the, the cost of living crisis less bad than it otherwise would be. The third reason to be mildly encouraged for the outlook, I think, is that uh, it's the British consumer and actually their appetite for spending uh, in, all, in all circumstances. Um, as we see like throughout the first quarter of this year, prices are rising, but people are still spending. The economy is still growing in these few months. Um, and this is despite the fact that consumer confidence has dipped uh, recently um, and is at a, a lower level. I think one of my reasons for optimism here is that households have been able to save over the course of the last two years uh, much greater amounts than they normally would, would have done. Um, so there are a lot of savings in the bank uh, right now. In fact, £186 billion more has been squirreled away than people normally would have done um, over and above their sort of normal savings levels. That's what we've seen. So that's equivalent to about 8% of GDP. Obviously, this is not evenly distributed across everyone. Um, it tends to have gone to the better off households. But new research suggests that actually um, it's, it has been a little bit more even than was initially thought, and that probably um, the, the top three quarters of the income distribution in aggregate have been net savers over this period. So a lot of people do have a bit of a cushion against rises in the cost of living. So they, they will be able to kind of sustain their, their consumption uh, through this period should they choose to spend some of those savings. The other thing is that Households now have more capacity to borrow to support their living standards than they did going into uh, COVID. Um, you can see on the, the chart, hopefully, that we saw a period where consumer credit, uh, that's sort of how much people were borrowing on their cards and in loans from banks, that decreased over the course of the pandemic. People were not spending on their credit cards. They, they were net paying them, paying them down. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, outstanding unsecured lending is 26 billion pounds less now than it was pre-COVID. So um, people do have uh, the ability to, to kind of borrow a little bit more now to get them through. And the evidence from February, um, from last month, is that they did just that, actually. Um, in that month, you can see that people borrowed two billion pounds uh, overall. That's three times more than they, they did on average over the last six months. Uh, and it's the largest we've seen for four years. So I think some people will be reacting to these higher price pressures just by deciding to kind of borrow to get them through for a bit. Um, that's clearly welcome from, uh, from a sort of wider perspective and uh, will give the, the, the recovery uh, some support. Finally, uh, my final cause for optimism is that COVID continues uh, to fade steadily into the background. Um, people are resuming living their lives. Um, we now see, and this is official data from the, uh, the ONS, just one in three adults are worried about COVID. And that's down from eight in 10 uh, uh, at the start of last year. Um, and I think even more welcome is that we've seen a continued downward trend, despite the fact there are high levels of transmission in the community uh, over the course of the last few months. And I think that makes sense. We've seen phenomenally high take up of vaccines uh, across the country. Um, and we've seen many people having had the virus as well and having got through it and having built up natural immunity. Um, it is still the case that uh, the over 50s are more concerned about it, uh, about the virus, rightly so, given the distribution of health impacts. Um, uh, they're a third likely, more likely to be worried than younger people. So there is a greater degree of caution in that segment of the population. 
But, but people's behaviors are changing. People are wanting to get back to normal. Um, and when we look at people's actual behavior, what we see on something like social distancing is that a year ago, almost everyone was doing it. You know, nine in 10 people said they were social distancing when they were going out. Um, now it's just one in four people. Um, what I read into that is that people want to get back to what's important, which is spending time close to others like we're doing today. Um, so I think it's positive for, for people's kind of demand for, for short breaks, for outings, for, for holidays over the course of this year. I think all those things are definitely back on the cards. Um, that said, it is interesting that at the same time, we also see people are willing to take what they perceive as relatively low cost options to mitigate their risk. So people are, are still very willing to wash their hands and they report that they're washing their hands frequently. People are also continuing to wear masks in, uh, in settings as well. These are low cost things that people can do. Um, so I think similarly, actually, people can be persuaded. Uh, I'm thinking about the sort of UK market here. I think people can be persuaded to holiday in Scotland this year. I think a lot of people will be umming and ahhing about whether or not to take that, that first international trip for a couple of years. And they may well desi decide to take, uh, to take another break within the UK. Again, it's kind of like another low cost option. You know, there's great opportunities, as you will know, for things to do here in Edinburgh. So just to wrap up, um, I think, unfortunately, to, I don't want to be the bearer of news, I don't like it, but I think 2022 is likely to be the year of the cost of living squeeze. Um, price pressures really are likely to sh slow the pace of recovery, um, weigh on people's incomes and be a bit of a drag on consumption growth. But please do not like, lose sight of the fact that we've had this phenomenal success recovering from the impact of COVID overall. Um, Scotland's economy, like other advanced economies, is now firmly uh, firing on, on all cylinders again. And the availability of jobs, uh, people's saving buffers, their ability to, to kind of take out credit lines if they need to, I think should embolden households to, to keep spending on what matters to them, uh, especially as their, their fear of the virus kind of uh, continues to, to decrease. So I hope that there is enough in there to, to give people their kind of uh, confidence going forwards. Um, thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon. <laughs>